Hey, I'm Ming, and you're about to watch Caribbean Inside TV. Well, hello there. You are watching Caribbean Inside TV, the engine room of culture. When he first came to power in 1956, only 14,000 students in Trinidad and Tobago could go to school. What he said was to educate is to emancipate. It is the duty of every man to educate his own child and he had no more business to call on the government to make provision for the education of his child than to ask them to provide it with food and drink. This was on the eve of the Jamaica Rebellion of 1865, three years later, which was a demand for land for black small farmers to be distributed by the government from state lands that had already been alienated, but either not exploited or were in arrears of taxes. The rebellion virtually coincided with the abolition of black slavery in the United States and the emancipation of the serfs, millions of them in Russia. It was put down with the brutality customary in colonial areas, martial law for 30 days, 439 people put to death, shot as rebels or hanged after court martial, 600 including women flogged a thousand houses burned. But a British soldier, not a British soldier or sailor, not a maroon who were called out to help the British was injured. The result was an enormous outcry in England, while in Jamaica, the old colonial assembly of white self-government was abolished and crown colony government substituted. The outcry in England was about a charge of murder leveled against the governor and whether a rebellion in a black country should be treated like a peasant's revolt in a European country. The question of whether the Jamaica plantation economy showed a generation after the abolition of slavery be broken up into small-scale farming, transforming the slave into a peasant proprietor instead of a wage worker on the white planter's land, was conspicuously absent in the discussion. Britain knew nothing of peasant farming with its large-scale capitalistic enclosures. The Civil War in America had been fought to preserve the slave cotton plantation and prevent its fragmentation into small holdings for black slaves and poor whites. The emancipation of the serfs in Russia reinforced the centuries-old unfreedom and the control of the master. There were more serfs after than there were before, respreading serfdom into industry and the rail. In this situation, we have Mr. Karl Marx. Sitting enthroned in London, his first volume of Capital about to be published, the Communist Manifesto promulgated as the Bible of the Communism of the Future. He was absolutely silent on Jamaica because he had already pontificated and would pontificate much more against the peasantry whom he damned for all time. I don't know whether you would understand this, but this is the quotation from the man. As a hieroglyph indecipherable for any cultivated spirit. As for the Irish who came closest in the Britain of 1865 to the traditional peasant economy, Engels damned him too. He wrote, his crudity places him little above the savage. I don't know whether he would say the same thing today, but still, I mean, he's not there for me to ask him. <laughs> it was just what the Southern Cracker was saying of his black slaves. The relationship between master and slave in the Southern states was, and this was one of the principal senators of the South, speaking, instead of an evil, a good, a positive good. The Russian serfs had to pay for the land, getting for the most part by the division less than they had been allowed to operate as serfs. When they serfs, they had a part of the land that they could operate under certain terms. The worst of the restrictions after liberation was the absence of any demarcation of the former serfs' legal rights and legal duties. Why Marx had nothing to say about the liberation of the Russian serfs is not clear. It's happening there. On the abolition of slavery in the United States, he was concerned with the international implications. Would England recognize the South as a belligerent? Would the North win? And he promulgated what has been adequately rejected on the basis of extensive research. The propaganda that the working man of Lancashire, the man in the cotton industry, supported the North against the South. That is to say, was for the emancipation of the slaves. 
the textile worker was no such thing. But on November the 17th, 1865, Engels wrote the following letter to Marx. I quote it. What have you got to say about the insurrection of niggers in Jamaica and the brutalities of the English? Three days later, Marx replied as follows, I quote, The Jamaican story is characteristic of the cur-like vileness of your true Englishman. These fellows have nothing to reproach the Russians with. Talk about Russia and England and said nothing about the poor Jamaica. The question of the role of the small farmer, Mr. Party Chairman, as everybody in this audience knows, in our agricultural development, was an important issue in our general elections in 1976 in Trinidad and Tobago. But it's not academic in stuff we're dealing with. Our opponents calling for state ownership of the sugar industry and then they're giving it over to the giving it over to the workers, workers' ownership. Whilst we proclaim the protection and improvement of the cane farmer, they wanted to take away the land from the cane farmer. With division of lands not suited for sugar into small farms or cooperatives for diversified agriculture. You remember the point? We went all over the country, 1976. Eh? Our white paper on agriculture spelled this out. Since then, our political scene has now been diversified by a communist party of Trinidad and Tobago so that it becomes most relevant to us to consider the place of the peasantry under a communist regime with priority to the thinking on it by Marx, Lenin and Stalin and therefore to anticipate our position in the next election what we're going to say about the peasantry, what we're going to say about agriculture and what we're going to say about the communists who stand for collectivization of agriculture and getting rid of the peasant. I'll tell you some of the things that I will tell you some of the things that you can deal with them with. Like the Boy Scouts, you know, be prepared. You don't know when it will come. So, the young Marx was in his early writings a great champion of freedom and the choice of occupation. He contrasted the capitalist system of production, in which every man was kept chained to a rigid sphere of activity, with the ideal of a regulated communist society in each, which each man would be able, I quote him, to do this today and that tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, to fish in the afternoon, to carry on cattle breeding in the evening. The of euphoria did not last long. In his doctrine of Marxism, he was generally so utterly concerned with the industrial proletariat, working class, as to seem annoyed at the very existence of a needy rural class. It has been said of Marx and his disciples, I quote, they paid attention to the peasants only because they looked upon them with a dislike in which the townsman's contempt for all things rural and the economist's disapproval of small-scale production, another attack on the PNM with its people sector and its small business, mingled with the bitterness of the revolutionary collectivists against the stubbornly individualistic tiller of the soil. Marxism proclaimed a holy war against the peasants, culminating in the liquidation of the Russian peasantry by the victorious Soviets. Could we make our, Mr. Party Chairman, could we make our election statement here now? Nobody will liquidate the peasantry in Trinidad and Tobago as long as we have the PNM. <laughs> Listen to what you will be up against if they quote the things for you. If they don't quote them, ask them about it. Tell them that I have all, and what I give you here tonight, I have plenty more. For everyone I give you, I could give you five minutes. <coughs> Manifesto of the first meeting of the first international in Geneva. The year is 1869. Capitalism, science, interests of society combined to quote condemn small-scale farming to gradual extinction without appeal and without mercy. This is four years after the Jamaica Rebellion in 1865, about which he said. Second quote, the Communist Manifesto. Yeah, that is 1848. The peasant was doomed, and he was doomed because he was a peasant. The peasant was the most primitive and irrational form of exploitation. A class of barbarian, uniting in itself all the crudeness of primitive social forces with all the tortures and all the misery of modern society. 
That's what you want to put to your people down in Karani? That's what Pandey want? As someone has said, this was less an economic program than a historical decree. A third quotation from one of Marx's books, The 18th Brumaire. The evil to which the French peasant is succumbing is just his dwarf holding. The partition of the soil, the form of tenure which Napoleon consolidated in France. Another one, volume three of Capital. Engels had limited what Marxists might do for the peasants to tax relief, restriction of rent, and protection against usury, excessive interest. For to do more, quoting, especially to give them the land of the larger states, would be to make them into a stranglehold of bourgeois reaction. A program in 1891, the first attempt to move the Marxist philosophy into action. The peasantry was listed among the social middle layers which are drummed. And again, in the third volume of Capital, Engels said that fortunately, why he put it in quotes, I don't know, they were left across the seas enough virgin land to ruin all the large European landlords and the small ones as well. I don't know what he was talking about, possibly the United States. He said, quote, we have no use in the party, the Communist Party, for the peasant who expects from us the perpetuation of his dwarf property. He can only expect it here in Trinidad and Tobago with proper uh, guarantees, credit, capital, uh, electricity, and so on, proper roads, only expect it from the PNN. One of Marx's harshest critics has left us a picture that this whole scientific and political activity, nowhere will we find signs that Marx had seriously studied the actual state of the peasants in any one land. His way had been to formulate a general theory and simply sweep them into it, never considering them as a subject fitted for a special plan of a before. It was a sentence without trial, all his life, not only as an economist, but also as a townsman and revolutionary. Marx was filled with undisguised contempt for the peasant. Politically, they lacked the unity of a class, being rather, as he called it, listen, an agglomeration of individuals which he compared to a sack of potatoes. He even found it in him to praise capitalism for having rescued his phrase, a considerable part of the population from the idiocy of rural life. End of the quotation. That's the Communist Manifesto. They were stupid and narrow-minded churls, proved throughout history incapable of any revolutionary initiative. Man is wrong as hell. Some of the most revolutionary people in the course of history in all countries have been the peasants provided. They are fighting for the land. They're not revolutionary for anything else. This was the background against which the Russian Revolution of 1917 took place. And now you can't just simply say this is that they have a party here in Trinidad now. Used to have them, the fellow travelers before, now they have the party. With the peasants seizing the land on their own initiative, Lenin realized that he had to give way to support small property, not against capitalism, he said, but against feudalism. He had to make concessions. But he did it with the biggest set of rigmarole and nonsense you could think of. Listen. Having defeated the bourgeoisie, the proletariat must unswervingly conduct its policy towards the peasant along the following lines. The proletariat must support and distinguish the peasant toilers from the peasant owner. The peasant workers from the peasant huckster. The peasant who labors from the peasant who profiteers. In this distinction lies the whole essence of socialism. What he missed, of course, that the peasants weren't interested one goddamn bit in the essence of socialism or the essence of capitalism. All they wanted was the piece of land that they thought they should have had for generations. So he made all these, they made all these concessions until Stalin decided in 1929 to take over the land, collectivize agriculture, destroy the peasants as a class, said the Kulaks, the rich peasant, rich peasant, my aunt. Rich peasant of the man who owned 20 acres. And takes over this, and then you have endless trouble. The industrialization is good. We're talking here about a social system now. Get rid of the peasant and peasant exploitation and drive them into the factories producing on a large scale on the capitalist system, the assembly land, etc. 
and you could do that. So the peasants went into it and destroyed all their crops and so on. So that Stalin told Churchill in 1944 that he had more difficulty in winning his fight with the peasants than he had in winning the Battle of Stalin. We could pass now to some other races, can't we? Two Amerindians and Europeans. I don't want to prolong this too much, Mr. Chairman. You can have this typed out, and I would like to see, particularly the Youth League, especially when I come to the end, taking steps to have thorough canvas and study of this particular matter. I'm giving the party an assignment for its next 25 years, and I want the Youth League to be in the vanguard. <laughs> How and why did the African get to America? Somebody has put it, the black African as an agricultural implement or object of trade was dragged from one continent to cultivate a second for the profit of masters living in the world. I think we should make it a little more specific than that. The black labor of one continent was substituted for the red labor of another continent for the profit of white masters living in a third continent. That is what is involved, that is what we are part of. So the Amerindians could not withstand the slavery on the plantation. Where was the alternative supply of labor to come? Las Casas to the rescue. Bring in the African slave. In his own day, his own colleagues in the church asked him, but how you could say that you don't want slavery for the Amerindian and you would have it for the black? Is the difference? And the Portuguese settlers told him, if you could go and, in, and enslave an Ethiopian, why shouldn't you enslave an Amerindian in Maranhão, which is a part of Brazil? Who were the Amerindians? Columbus called them Indian because he was certain that he had reached India or China. But dear friends, there is one race. Somebody has said, so much is that so. There's so much a lack that they could only be divided geographically, north, south, east, west, west. Which isn't strictly correct. They could be divided linguistically, a tremendous linguistic diversity, the whole continent. And they could be distinguished by their method, their basis of subsistence and method of production. Those who were in sedentary forms of agriculture, those who were tax gatherers in the forest, those who were hunters, those who were fishermen. From what same place did they come out? What same ship had they made? What same ship had they come on? And here you have one of the great curiosities of the modern world, that there are people all over the place who tell you the most difficult way, they came by the most difficult way, didn't come by ship at all. Where Siberia, borders on Alaska, Asia, North America, in the period when the whole earth was frozen over, etc., etc. It was very easy to walk across. And at that particular time, all these Mongoloids in Siberia took the opportunity to come and follow the game and the fish, perhaps, and walk all over this bridge, this ice bridge, and go down right from Alaska, right down to Patagonia, so on where it has been well known by everybody, a lot of people have tested it out, that provided the currents are all right, the currents are favorable and the season is right, you have easiest possible crossing in the smallest of boats from Africa, from the Atlantic, and from the Pacific. It seemed possible that the man who had been part of the consciousness of a people for more than 36 years was no more. Some even insisted on evidence of his death. Let me take this moment to thank you guys for your unwavering support of the culture of TNT. Remember to subscribe if you have not done it as yet to keep our culture alive. I'm Lady V and I'll catch you on our next pit stop. Take care of each other and thank you for watching. <laughs>
E-R-X. Hey, Bongo S again. Right now, you're locked on to CITV. Do move that dial. Subscribe, like, share. All you don't know is we culture is we thing. Boom.